Now that you are familiar with the Heck programming language, uh, it's time to see what we can actually do with this language. And so in the next three units, we're going to talk about the general subject of low-level uh, programming, and in particular, programming in the Heck machine language. Now, before we get started, I'd like to uh, give you an overview of uh, the two instructions that we have uh, in the Heck language. So we have the um, A instruction, which is used to set the value of the A register to a particular value. And we have the C instruction, which is used to do three different things. We can uh, compute a certain uh, expression. Uh, we can store the value of this uh, computation in some destination. And optionally, we can, uh, based on the value of this uh, computation, we can decide to jump and execute something which exists in a different region of the program. We can perform a go-to operation. Now, uh, this language, as you clearly see in this slide, is symbolic. It consists of mnemonics. And computers don't understand the symbols other, th other than uh, 0 and 1. And therefore, before we can execute uh, anything which is written in symbolic uh, uh, hack machine language, we have to first translate it into binary code. And this is something which is typically done by a program called Assembler. And what we see here is this uh, program in action. It takes a file which is written in... Uh, uh, symbolic language, and it translates it into another file uh, written in uh, also in symbols, but these symbols are only zeros and ones. Having produced uh, uh, the target code in, uh, in binary code, we can actually take this file, load it into uh, the heck computer, and finally execute the, uh, the intended uh, program. So this is the heck assembler, and uh, in uh, week six of this course, we will actually build uh, such an assembler. But uh, for now, I just want you to remember that uh, it is available to you if you want to use it. The other option of uh, translating uh, uh, symbolic programs into binary code is to use the supplied CPU emulator. I can take, uh, you can take any program that you write in a symbolic hack language, load it directly as is into uh, the CPU emulator, and uh, the CPU emulator is, is just a, it's a Java program, and uh, it has an icon that allows you to load uh, uh, files into the uh, instruction memory. As you load these files into the instruction memory, the CPU emulator gives you this very nice service of translating the programs on the fly into uh, machine language. So uh, once this happens, you can actually execute the program in the CPU emulator, and the result is that the CPU emulator is a very friendly tool for debugging and executing uh, hack programs in uh, simulation. And therefore, we recommend that if you want to play with, uh, with the code uh, snippets that you will see uh, in the subsequent units, we recommend that you do it using the supplied uh, CPU emulator. All right, so moving along, what do we mean when we talk about uh, low-level programming? Well, surprisingly enough, uh, we mean a whole bunch, bunch of issues that you find in any uh, programming language. Things like working with memory and variables and branching, iteration, pointers, inputs and outputs. Uh, these uh, idioms are uh, uh, widely used in any programming language and the heck uh, machine language is uh, no exception. So uh, in this unit we'll begin to talk about uh, uh, registers and memory and in subsequent units we'll talk about uh, uh, the other subjects which are slightly more advanced. All right, so um, registers and memory is the bread and butter of low-level low programs, and that's what you do all the time. You manipulate registers uh, which are either uh, the two standard registers that we have, D and A, which reside inside uh, the CPU. If you recall, uh, the data register can hold a, a single 16-bit uh, value, uh, the A register can uh, hold either a data value or an address, depending uh, in the context in which uh, the programmer wants to uh, use this uh, uh, register. And finally, we use the letter M, or the mnemonic M, to uh, refer to the currently selected memory register. If you recall, the A register has this nice side effect that when you load it with a particular value, 
it ends up selecting one register from the RAM. This register in our language is called M. So we can then say something like M equals minus one or M equals zero and so on and so forth. All right, so these are the registers of interest that uh, we're going to manipulate. And here are some examples of what, we actually, uh, what actually can be done with these registers. Let us assume that you want to store the number 10 in, um, in register uh, D. Well, it turns out that there's no direct way to do it. If you look up the language documentation, there's no C instruction that lets you do something like that. So we have to do it indirectly. And what we do is we set the A register to 10, and then we say D equals A. Simple. Moving along, what about incrementing the value of D? Well, it turns out that this actually can be done uh, uh, directly in, in one uh, instruction only, because once again, if you look up the documentation of the C instruction, you will see that you can tell the ALU to compute the value of D plus one, and then you can take the, the result and store it in D. So effectively, we perform a D++ operation. What about setting D to the value of RAM 17? Well, whenever you want to access a particular uh, memory register, you first have to address the memory. You have to select this register. So we preempt this operation with an at 17. And now having selected uh, the register of interest, we set it or we set D to the value of this register. Uh, likewise, we can do the reverse operation. We can do rem17 equals d, and we do exactly the same, but uh, in reverse. Moving along, what about setting rem17 to 10? Well, I can do this using a combination of what I did before. I, first of all, I, I acquire the constant 10 somehow, you know, using these two uh, instructions, and then I set uh, uh, rem17 uh, to the value of d, which by now is 10. What about setting uh, RAM3 to RAM5? Well, once again, we can do it using uh, similar uh, operations. And if you want, you can stop the video, uh, take another look at, this, uh, at all these uh, five code examples, and convince yourself that they do what, uh, what they intend to do. All right, so uh, let us take these uh, um, memory manipulation operations and registers uh, manipulations and put them in the context of an actual program. So here's a program which is designed to take two values which are stored in RAM0 and RAM1, add them up, and save uh, the result in RAM2. Now, why these particular three words, RAM0, 1, and 2? Well, this is an arbitrary choice. We just decided that we'll use the first two words in the memory for input, so to speak, and uh, the third uh, uh, memory word for the output of, of this program. So how do we do it? Well, you may have guessed, we use very similar operations to what uh, uh, we did before. And uh, uh, if we run this program, hopefully it will compute the, uh, the sum of RAM0 and RAM1. Now, before we go on, I'd like to uh, remind you that instructions in the hack language have implicit line numbers. You don't see them when you write the program, but these numbers kind of lurk in the background. And when you translate this program and load it into memory, uh, there's some interesting uh, observations that, uh, that, that we have to make. First of all, white space is ignored. And the only instructions that get uh, into play, so to speak, are the real instructions, you know, the instructions that have uh, line numbers in this uh, in this uh, example here. And uh, in addition, it's important to remember that what we see here in the, um, um, in the instruction memory is a symbolic view of this program. You know, this program as such cannot execute on the computer because the computer cannot handle symbols other than zero and one. But if you played with our CPU emulator, you know that you can tell the emulator to show you uh, uh, the contents of the instruction memory in binary, and if you do it, you will see the program uh, in this uh, uh, manifestation, and, and, and in this state, the program can actually execute on the computer. But typically, once again, it's much easier to think about the program, talk about it, and debug it 
when the program is written in symbolic form and therefore we recommend that you know when you try to understand what a program is doing do it symbolically and only when you're ready to run it uh, if you want you can take a look at the binary code uh, but it's very difficult to uh, decode what the binary code is doing uh, anything so we are fortunate to have all these symbols to make our programs more readable all right so with that in mind I'd like to um, uh, invoke the CPU emulator and uh, give you a demo of how this program is actually uh, executing. So the purpose of this demo is to illustrate how to write uh, a little program in the heck symbolic language and then run it on the CPU emulator. So I have two windows uh, opened up here. One is the uh, CPU emulator in the uh, foreground and in the background I have uh, a simple text editor that I can use to write my program. So let's write it. We'll begin with some comments which are uh, which describe what this program is doing. So let's uh, say um, uh, adds up two numbers and uh, let's give some uh, usage uh, advice to the person who is going to use this program put the values uh, that you wish to add in uh, RAM 2, in uh, RAM uh, 0 and RAM 1 and uh, let's add here uh, some more information RAM 2 becomes RAM 0 plus RAM 1. All right, very nice. So uh, let us begin to write the program. I use some indentation for purposes that will become clear in subsequent units. So I do uh, at A, I'm sorry, at uh, 0, D equals M at 1 d equals d plus m and now we can put the result in 2 n equals d and that's the end of the program. Let's uh, save the program using something that you cannot see now because it's far away on the screen so we want to save the program We'll give it the most imaginative name, uh, demo.asm. We save it. And now we can uh, go back to the CPU emulator and load the program. So I click uh, the load button. And uh, let's see. I should have a directory called program examples and here it is and demo is right here so I pick demo I load it and here's the program that I wrote now notice that uh, the program contains only the real instructions if you go back to the source we see that we have you know comments white space and so on so when you load a program into into the emulator you get to see or actually the only uh, instruction the only lines that get loaded so to speak are the real instructions and as these instructions are being loaded into this uh, GUI here they're also being translated into machine language and I can see that if I uh, change the representation here to binary and I see the program as it really is uh, inside uh, the ROM in binary code. But once again, it's much more convenient to see this program in, uh, I'm sorry, in, uh, in symbolic code. Okay, so I was told that I have to put some values in 0 and 1, so I go ahead and put the value uh, 5 here and uh, 7 there, and then I um, begin to run the program. So let's see, uh, we execute the first command and we see that uh, uh, nothing happens yet but A became 0 
and then we do d equals m and we see that uh, the d register now contains 5 which is very nice indeed then we do at 1 and we see that a contains 1 let's do d equals d plus m we see that d have, uh, became uh, 12 then we uh, set a to 2 we do m equals d and uh, we see that uh, lo and behold ram2 contains 12 which is exactly what we wanted to get so the program seems to be working before we end this demonstration I would like to present the fast forward control and also use this opportunity to show you something uh, bizarre that may happen if you don't take proper action so I have loaded the same program into the simulator and now I'm using different test values 350 and minus 40 and then I will use the fast forward control to run the program unattended, uh, so to speak. And we see that the program runs uh, properly, and in fact it comes out uh, with the right result. 350 plus minus 40 is indeed 310. But we see that the computer is continuing to execute the so-called program where, in fact, the program has ended already, right? As far as we are concerned, the program has ended, but as far as the computer is concerned, the program actually continues, and it seems that things are getting out of control. So having seen the demo that, uh, that we just went through, and uh, having seen also the problem that we encountered uh, at the end of this demo, um, let us see what, what can we do in order to terminate a program properly. Now, to remind you, the problem that we had is that the, um, uh, the flow of control became uh, kind of uncontrollable. And basically, you know, we told the computer to execute every instruction, and everything was just fine, but then uh, other so-called instructions uh, uh, came into play, and the computer basically went out of control. Now, if I were a hacker, if I were a bad hacker, and I would have seen this uh, pattern of execution, I would say, well, you know, maybe I can uh, write some uh, malicious uh, program and put it somewhere downstream in this uh, memory, and then I would let the user run uh, his or her program uh, naively. The user will, you know, happily run his program. The program will actually do what it's supposed to do, but then, unknowingly, the computer will continue executing, and then, boom, you know, my uh, program will go to work and will start to do some bad things like uh, uh, deleting uh, random files on the uh, user's computer. So what can we do in order to, uh, uh, to avoid this uh, potential problem? By the way, this particular attack is called uh, NOP slide and uh, NOP stands for null instructions or null opcodes. And what we have here in instructions 6 onward are uh, null instructions. And uh, a bad hacker can use these, these instructions to slide the flow of control to an area of the memory that uh, he controls, and then something bad can happen. What can we do to avert this problem? And in general, what can we do to terminate a program uh, properly? Well, one thing that you have to understand is that computers never stand still. They always do something. You know, even when you don't touch the keyboard, there are many processing processes running in the background. So in the hack computer, because we don't want the computer to do something crazy, uh, we might as well uh, cause the computer to do something that we control. So what we can do is we can end the program with an infinite loop. We can add two commands like uh, at 6 and then in 7 jump to 6. So we have once again at 6 and then in 7 jump to 6, jump, 6, jump, 6 and, and so on. And we have this uh, infinite loop and everything is under control because this is something that we intended our program to do. So as a best practice advice, we recommend that you end every one of your programs with an infinite loop. All right. Uh, before the end of this unit, I'd like to um, say a few things about uh, 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 another feature of the language that we haven't yet discussed, and by saying this, I'm basically going to complete the specification of, uh, of the Heck machine language. The language uh, features several uh, built-in symbols, and uh, here they are. 
Uh, first of all, we have a set of 16 uh, so-called virtual registers, or to say it more accurately, we have a, a set of 16 labels that we use as if they represented virtual registers. And these uh, 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 labels range from R0 to R15, and the contract is such that whenever the assembler or you know, the translator sees a label like R3, it will replace it with a number 3. That's all. So you may ask yourself, you know, why do we need this, uh, 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 these uh, fancy labels? Well, here's an example where uh, these labels can come to play. This is a very simple piece of code in which we set REM5 to 15. Now, let's read carefully uh, what is going on here. In the first pair of instructions, we use the A register as a data register. We put the number 15 into A, and then we move it into D. In the second pair of instructions, we do something remarkably different. We use the at 5 command to uh, address the memory, to select memory register number 5. And then we do M equals D. So there's something you know, troubling about this code. First of all, we do two very different things, but we use exactly the same syntax, at number. That's one thing which is a little bit, I think, uh, uh, disconcerting. And the other thing which is somewhat troubling is that when you read a single A instruction, you have no idea what the programmer wanted to do until you see the next instruction. So how can we make this thing more readable? Well, our advice is that whenever you want to address one of the first 16 uh, uh, registers in the memory, use uh, the, uh, uh, the label uh, convention, and then anyone who reads your program will know exactly what you want to do, including yourself, because, you know, machine language programs are difficult to read and, and comprehend, and therefore we have to make every effort to make them more readable so that next time you see your program a week from now or two weeks from now, you will know what the program is doing. So in the second example that you see on the right, it's a very small difference compared to the left one, but it's much more readable. And also effectively, the program will do exactly the same thing because once it will get translated, the R5 will change to five, and then we are back to uh, where we were before. So this is the motivation why we, uh, uh, we recommend to use these uh, so-called uh, virtual registers. Uh, there's one thing that you have to worry about, and this is the fact that, like many other programming languages, heck is case sensitive. And uppercase R5 is not the same as lowercase R5, and uh, we recommend that you remember this, uh, uh, this uh, observation here, because if you forget it, it can cause all sorts of very exotic bugs. And in the future, if you have a program that has no syntax problems and you have no idea what this program is doing, uh, there's a good chance that uh, you misspelled one of your uh, symbols. So keep this uh, in, the back of your, in the back of your mind when you run your own uh, symbolic programs. Uh, what other symbols do you have in the language? Well, uh, we also have screen and keyboard, which we uh, discussed there previously in one of the units. Uh, they stand for the base addresses of uh, the screen and the keyboard uh, memory maps. And we also have a set of uh, six additional symbols that we don't really uh, use in this course. So let me wrap up uh, the symbols, the, the built-in or the predefined symbols in the hack language. We have 16 virtual registers. We have uh, two symbols that stand for base addresses of uh, input-output maps, and we have a set of six symbols which are used by people who want to write virtual machines and compilers for high-level languages that will operate on top of the hack platform. Now, this is something that we actually do in the second part of this course called NAND to Tetris Part 2, uh, but we won't use these uh, uh, six registers in the present course. All right, so this has been uh, a brief overview of working with registers and memory, and in the next unit we are going to talk about uh, branching, variables, and iteration.